Scotland as a whole meant quite a lot to the commanders, although we were drawn from all over, from Cornwall to Shetland. The West Highlands served the British Army well in starting off this idea of really arduous infantry training. So although no enemy set his foot on the Highlands, and although they might seem remote from London and suffer very little from blitzes, it played its important part in the war. After Dunkirk, and Churchill wanted troops, assault troops that could hit back, and uh, he entrusted the job at first to Lord Lovett and his cousin Bill Stirling. Lovett and Stirling began training men for unconventional warfare in remote country houses throughout La Harbour. Their work spawned the SAS, the Special Boat Section, and the commanders. For most of the war, large-scale commander training was centred at Achnakari Estate, ancestral home of the Camerons of Lochiel. I think the army chose it because they wanted a place here that was um, in the protect, what they call the protected zone, north of the canal. It was easy to get at, to, by the rail to, to Spearn Bridge. It was remote. It had ideal training ground with the river and hills and that sort of thing. So I think they very quickly appreciated that it was an ideal place for the army. My father, being a very loyal and patriotic person, I think probably accepted that uh, it, it was very suitable for them. The house was occupied by the officers, became an officer's mess. I think there were 150 officers in it at one time, and about 2,000 soldiers outside. I mean, at the end, they had huts in every conceivable place, every level bit of ground outside. Blimey! Listen to this, chaps. Commando. A term used during the Boer War. A body of armed burghers. Blimey, nobody can call me that and get away with it. That's an insult. Forget it, Mac. The bloke who wrote this dictionary can't even spell. I was absolutely determined to join the commanders. People today don't realise that this was a, a war where the vanders were black versus white. Uh, today it's two muddy shades of grey. So um, I, I had no doubt that my problem was, could I get in? I was fed up. You see, my father had lost a lung just during the First World War at the hands of the Germans. My parents were being bombed in Manchester, where we lived. My career had been halted substantially. And I thought the only thing to do is, is to get involved and in a very pragmatic way, kill people. My father had been in the signal sergeant in the Cameron Islanders at the Battle of Luz. I grew up with legends of laying cable under shot and shell. So I joined the Royal Corps of Signals at Glasgow University OTC, um, but found quite quickly that although we wore putties and had boots and looked rather dashing, uh, signaling was a matter of intricacies with wireless sets, and I was absolutely no good at that. Volunteering for the commandos was the only way to get back into the kind of war which I felt I, I might do something. One of the instructors, a senior to me, Major Smith, had been in the Indian Army, and he couldn't understand why a young chap like me was, was not looking or trying to get into the action. Almost a day later, he was back with a newspaper in which showed commanders had come back from a raid, their black faces, all smiling, and he jabbed his finger at the picture and said, that's what you should be in. So, being stupid, I applied. You were brought into a room with a sort of 40-watt bulb and hanging from the ceiling, and it's the middle of winter. There are four officers there. One of them's an M.O. And you have a major, a captain, and a lieutenant. But they're not sitting facing you. They're all round about you. I was dressed in you know, my Cameroonian uniform, my tartan trousers, my belt shining and so on, but they all seem quite so disgusted with the display. And the whole thing is, try is designed to upset you in the course of the interview. So, uh, the, at the same time, of course, the medical officer, of course, is, is giving the, the perfect bedside manner, and you're looking round all over the place trying to see where the next question's coming from. So, <clears throat> he will sort of say, now stand on one leg, take a deep breath, and immediately the Major comes forward and says, Why do you want to die so young? They asked me questions like, uh, do you play sport? And uh, were you a Boy Scout? And how, 
uh, have your sex life. And at the end of 20 minutes, you know, you just didn't know what to expect, and I turned around and discovered that the, the lieutenant was actually smiling. I didn't know he could smile. And gradually looked around, and, and they were all smiling. And then they stood up and said, congratulations, Williamson, you're just the kind of man we want. <laughs> the relief was enormous. I was asked to go up to at the carry 400 or 500 miles in a train, non-stop, no food, water we had to get from snow off the top of the carriage through the night in a blacked out train arriving at Speen Bridge without any briefing. And that was, that was horrendous. Long me if we didn't start training as soon as we got there. No getting out onto the platform, that's too civilised. So with about 60 pounds worth of gear, we dropped onto the rails. Two antles were broken and they were put straight back on the train again. The instructors were on the other side of the platform and they were so fit, they were running up and down bristling with energy like butcher's bulldogs, you know, raring to go, wanting to get at us. And they did. It's seven miles to the camp from the station, uphill and down dale, and they forgot to order me a taxi. Never forget laughing when, uh, as soon as the troops came off the train, they were looking for transport, because they realised the camp was a fair bit away, and they said, right, it's only seven miles, and you're walking. As a matter of fact, you're running. And this was the first hill they encountered. Do you remember Correct. that, Ron? That's right. Uh -huh. They were allowed an hour to get to the gates of Ashnikari and were threatened with the fact that if they didn't get there within the hour, they'd be back on the 3.30 train in the afternoon and probably return to the units. It is lovely country, so, even in foulish wonderful, wonderful weather. Wonderful for training, of course. Oh, ideal for training, yes. Mud. Yes, and, and a lot of it. And rain. Presumably one of the reasons why the powers that be picked it as such very heavy rainfall. Of it was the highest rainfall in Britain. Yes. So once they got up this way, halfway, I used to say, well, now you're in God's own country, and normally you got the remark from the back, tell him to keep it, <laughs> or such like. Well, this is like a trip down memory lane, isn't, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. The old Caradonian Canal. This used to be operated by hand at one time, Ronnie. That's right. Now, of course, it's power operated. Yeah. Is this not known as Heartbreak Hill? That's right. This is Heartbreak Hill. It is a blooming heartbreak, too, especially if you've just been coming back from a 12 mile or something. 15. Oh, up to 15, yes. It's a, it's a real shove, this one. A real shove. It really took it out of the troops. We used to just say to them, it's all right, you've only got three more miles to go. <laughs> no problem. Hello, sir. Very nice to see you here. Very nice to nice see you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Wonderful to see you. Splendid to see you. Yeah. Splendid to see you. Yeah. It's typical afternoon carry weather. Isn't it? Indeed. Yes, indeed. indeed. <laughs> indeed. We get a lot of commanders visiting us, and I'm always delighted to see them. And it's, it, is, it is rather nice to be associated with such a wonderful body of men. Well, the seven miles soon went by, and we marched into Acne Carry Camp. It's a bit of a shocker, that name, if you don't happen to be Scott. But not half as much a shocker as the pretty little sideshow they've got right inside the camp gates. Graves, Steffi. A whole perishing row of them. Laid out to warn the new chaps not to be sort of careless like. Do you remember the dummy Graves? <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, right indeed. here. Indeed, yes. This man advanced over cover. Mm -hmm. This man put a bomb down the three inch mortar the wrong way. <laughs> you must remember some of the others. Yes, this man failed to examine his climbing rope. These three fired the mortar under a tree. <laughs> this person went over the top of cover instead of going round the side. Cool, what a reception. So by the time we actually got to these very cold Nissen huts, the message was coming home pretty clearly to me that this was some place. Commanding officer at Achnakari was Colonel Charles Vaughan. He'd worked his way up through the ranks and had seen action in the First World War. Donald Gilchrist was his adjutant. 
In the First World War, he thought that many of the soldiers who were sent to the Western Front had insufficient training, but even worse, they had no idea of the conditions they might meet. So, at Achnacarry, he was determined that we'd know what these conditions were like and at the same time train special troops. The legendary Colonel Vaughan took a look at myself, second lieutenant, aged just 20, and said that we don't recognise the Royal Corps of Signals here. And you're, Mr Gibson, you're back in the ranks for, for the next three months. But it was the very best thing that could have happened to me. They've got a good crack here. If the officers can do it, I can do it. If the officers can do it. The officers suffered as much as the men. <laughs> we were all in it together. The only ones who were enjoying it were the old sweats, the corporals training us, and Colonel Vaughan watching us. Charles Vaughan thought up me and my PAL courses, which meant that it was a lot easier or helpful to do these things if your pal was alongside, you could help each other get over the obstacles. My pal was a Canadian, and he had been in three actions already. His one fear was heights. That wasn't a bother with me, and I would help him uh, in, in that sort of thing. Uh, later on, he went on to be a parachutist and so had to conquer his fear of this. But uh, it was just that, that kind of uh, assistance one to another a very, very good system. Bonn reckoned that Hitler didn't stop the war because it was Sunday, so the training went on every day in the week. Also, he reckoned that Hitler didn't stop the war because it was raining or snowing. Now, at first, the trainees, and it was raining, it was coming down in buckets, they would huddle wherever they could get shelter, thinking, oh, they'll call off the training and we can go to the Nafi and drink tea. And the next minute there was bawling and shouting, and there they were doing the drill, was the rain pouring down, or doing log PT, or going off to the salt courses, or going off into the hills. It rains here too, twice every five minutes. At the carry was a crucible, and they started off, I think, by frightening you, so that you learned to live with fear. The training was tough because he had developed assault courses like the Tarzan course which ran along the trees beside the river Archaic, a network of ropes which uh, we tried to emulate Tarzan. They've got God knows how many different ways of getting across a river without having to take your boots off. It's a bit like hard work at first, but you soon get the hang of it. Seven drowned on one occasion. They had a death slide which used to slide across at full speed. Um, the object was to get from a high point to a low point as fast as possible. And we used to wear a toggle rope, which is a piece of rope with a toggle and a loop in one end, and was hung over. The rope broke, and they fell into the river. We used to throw bombs at them. They were blown off, and they uh, landed in the river, and uh, unfortunately, uh, they didn't get over it. They weren't able to make it. One had to be able to swim. Other double! March! The 14-mile speed march were done about two hours, ten minutes. But they all had to come back together. And in some cases, you'd find a man, one or two, in distress. But this is where the pals came in. That one would take his rifle, the other chap would take his pack, and they'd help him along, running like zombies. I had to do a speed march to Spian Bridge and back. Once my army braces burst, and I had to do the whole thing clutching at my trousers. Very inglorious, but <laughs> that was the worst moment. One of the most difficult things, I think, in the bad weather was a 36-hour scheme. There were 100 men out on a 36-hour scheme. And it rained from the moment we started until we finished. You went to sleep, soaked, cold, but if you're tired enough, you sleep. And we slept. And we were up very early in the morning, stamping our feet and trying to get warm, and it was off to make a mock attack down near Achnacarry. You learned camouflaging and all that, you know, and uh, how to live off the land, you see? And then one time we came in, you know, there was cooking, so they were, you know, it's the sergeant cook, see? Uh, how you like to sample this and that, you know? 
sample that. What's that? What's a piece of crow? You know? Yeah, so <laughs> next one, fancy this? Dear. What's that? Oh, just a piece of rat. Living off the land. An arm combat is one of the big things up here. How to tackle a bloke with your bare hands. Knock him out, spoil his prospects and pinch his weapon. This, after so many years, sounds horrible, but I and most of my friends felt that we were going to be killed. Our families were going to be killed. Our way of life was going to be totally destroyed. So when people taught me how to, to disable a man with a knife, I didn't reel back in horror. You know, how to cut his tendons, how to cut his throat, how to stop thinking you didn't kill a sitting target and how to welcome a sitting target. And if the fellow was also sitting with his back towards you, you were in luck. The object was to create as little disturbance as possible and do the job efficiently and disappear. So therefore, the fighting knife was adopted as the emblem of the commandos. Stand by each defensive. This area completely here was covered with all sorts of underwater uh, bombs. Ex explosives. Explosives which not in all directions. Rapid. Fire. The trees round about here, we had four Vickers guns and six uh, six inch mortars firing out to see all live ammo. We also had snipers in the trees, which their object was to shoot the paddles out of the trainee's hands to make it as real as possible. Well, it was almost a relief to get to this stage, because at least you only had this little bit to go up uh, uh -huh. beyond. The assault party went round the side here, and as they disappeared into the boot, we had five Bren guns shooting at them. When the very light went up to mean to say they're going in to attack, the gunners put their sights up to maximum and shot over their heads or were supposed to. Yes. But uh, there have been several fellows killed on this exercise, and uh, as we know, there was 41 killed altogether d during the training here at Aknikari. Loch Lochie, no, that's it in that memory. Lots of whiz bangs going off and charging onto the shore. After Catterick Parade Ground, it felt like getting onto the real thing. The object was to make it as realistic as possible, as near wartime conditions as possible. And I think we succeeded in this. I'm quite sure there a lot of lives saved as a result of that. We weren't allowed to sit in the gunnel, but if they sat in the gunnel, they got one through the rear end. And it has, it's, it's, several had that. Ask the Americans, uh, they were big fat chaps, so it was ideal targets for our snipers. A few weeks of this and Johnny Doughboy has graduated out of a hard school. One American got a ricochet through his buttock. And of course, at that time, this could be an international incident, and we've got the letters from the President of the United States and so on. But when they were going back, there they were, marching, shoulders hunched, soaked, hen toed like John Wayne, marching together, carrying their rifles. This man that had been hurt had become a joke. And a voice said, where do you say you got it, man? You don't say. Honest, right in the ass. Sure glad it ain't my ass. We had a unit in commandos which was number 10 inter-allied commando. Many of them had had miraculous escapes before they reached this country, and here they were, joining up in commandos, ready to go back into Holland or France. We could have French or Dutch or Belgians with us, who knew the language, knew the population, knew, and gave us a lot of information, and they were very gallant indeed. I had a place on my head, but we were, con we were condemned to death, to death by, the, by, the, by the German, you see, and uh, if they are found out, and uh, uh, I was in the Free French Forces, my family could have been arrested and tortured and things like that. And that's what I was thinking about at the time. I already knew the kind of training because I had done it in the French Marines, you see, before I, when I was in France. And then I, I knew what I was, what I was going in for in, in, a, in, in a commando. It was a great achievement. <laughs>
to throw away your Glen Gary and put on your green berry with your badge in it. You know? Well, why should I be sad on my wedding day? I mean, this was the, the great thing. You were going off to a, a real unit. Uh, you had a green berry at last. It was wartime. We were putting people into battle. And we had to make sure that they lived. So the harder we trained them, the more chance they had of living. The instructors almost had an obsession to fit you to kill a German. It, I, I reckon they would have been very offended if the German had killed you after what they trained you to do. Well, he was no longer a soldier, he was a commando soldier. Quite a difference. Jerry doesn't like these blokes. He never knows when they're coming or where. It, it sounded dangerous to be in the commanders, but actually you probably were a lot safer because you, you had people who could react instantly, at a moment's notice, to anything that happened. Uh, you always felt safer in the hands of professionals like that. I went to Fort Commander just in time for the Dieppe raid. We were lucky. From our point of view, it was a, almost a coffee book raid led by Lovett, in which went round the side, around the flank, and did got behind the guns. Here, commandos, already veterans of many beach assaults, and a strong force of Canadians who had been training and standing guard in Britain, went in against the German defences. Survivors stayed and fought for nine hours, but many fell on the beaches. The death raid, in many cases, is known as a disaster because the Canadians went into a cauldron of fire. And although in some ways there were great losses and so on, I like to think that these men that were lost, it wasn't for nothing. And I believe that many of the lessons that came from the Dieppe landing saved a lot of lives under the DD operations. Commanders won 38 battle honours and lost 1,706 men in action. Each year, survivors gather at the Commando Memorial in La Harbour. Once we get there, it becomes more a Highland gathering, together with the people of La Harbour, and this is where we feel we're part of the family up there. Naturally, you're thinking of the people who got lost on the way along, because that's the purpose of the statue. But uh, at the same time, there were so many wonderful things to remember about the commanders. One always thinks of the camaraderie. It was a very important period in people's lives. <laughs> 